Today we have our best update on the Beerus 160. Today, things are going well for sure. And then because they're on sale at the moment, it seems like a good time to give away an XR30 Radeon Pro. I'm Ryan, your host of Beerus TV. For those of you that have been with us for a while, you've got to enjoy the journey of building and setting up this tank from ground zero. This is certainly one of the more popular series that we've ever done, and I think it's likely because there's a lot of value in not just hearing a bunch of random advice, but more so seeing the results of those efforts and the type of success you can anticipate if you do something a certain way. It's been a few years now. We've all seen a lot. Hopefully, we've learned a few things. I know I certainly have. No matter what we all currently think we know, all we can really do is take what we've learned, implement it, maybe with some attempts to improve it, and then add some real life disruptions and then hope for the best. In this case, I think it all panned out pretty darn well and the journey's been worth the effort put into it. So in that spirit, we're gonna talk about how this tank is doing in general, some equipment notes at this point, a decent discussion about nutrients on this tank, some frank talk about the Triton method and how it's going, and lastly, where the future is going to take us. The tank is doing awesome, and I'll share that almost everything in the tank has been growing, coloration just gets better and better, and I think just about anyone that would look at this would call it a successful display tank. There is one troubled coral up front that I'd like to get to a bit later, but rather than just remove it like we probably would in most displays, I wanted to let you know exactly what happened here because I think it's valuable and I really want to see if we can nurse it back even though there's only a bit of tissue left. The growth at this point has actually started to become a problem like it does in most established tanks. We not only have run out of space for new corals, but they're actually getting so big on top that they're shading those down below. You can see some have even lost some tissue in the darkest areas. So while almost all of us are going for better growth, at some point that transitions into managing that growth. And I think as soon as this episode is done, we're going to frag a pretty substantial amount of corals out of the tank. It's just time to prune back significantly in some areas to allow others a chance to grow as well. Related to that, we're certainly second guessing some placement of the encrusting corals because they're now taking over their area. When worldwide battle corals, unique corals, and Austin Aqua Farms gave us corals for these tanks, we just needed to find a place to put them pretty rapidly. We're probably going to have to take a chisel to these corals fairly soon and get some frags going because they're growing all over each other. Some of you may remember that some of these corals had some issues with Monty eating nudies, and with the KZ flatworm stop and the six line wrasse, I've yet to see a single one now. Might be the six line alone, but I'm just not gonna mess with success here because I'm sure that they're in here somewhere, just not in populations that cause any visible issues. Some of you also may see that Fangs and Sir Chompslot have been laying eggs as well. A resident breeding expert has been hatching them out and they're now in the clown harem tank as well. You can expect to see a full update on that tank soon. Anyone who says that you can't have a long-term successful clown harem tank is just wrong. And I can certainly share our experience and results. I'd also note that this tank has incredible coralline coverage. I know a lot of people seem to struggle with that these days and very frequently blame LEDs. I don't know if that's accurate, but with our T5 LED hybrid solution, we're just not concerned about coralline. In fact, how fast it grows back is more of a maintenance issue than it is a good thing, but all the same, very often part of thriving tanks and a good sign of stability. Related to that, since lighting is such a big issue for everyone, I just want to remind everyone what we're running and how it's set up. With LEDs, there's often more success to be had by emulating other successes and leaving it alone rather than flipping random switches and percentages. Double so if you don't own a PAR meter. For those of you that don't know, we're shooting mostly for that 200 to 350 range where most SPS corals seem to do the best. We have five Kessel A360 LEDs in there banked by a total of four or five foot ATI Blue Plus bulbs. Two on each side. I can tell you right now that I think the T5s are one of the biggest keys to success here. And without them, I can say with 100% certainty that we would have had way more shading issues, mortality, and slower growth. Not to mention, this is a display tank that is supposed to look good. Kessels are known for some of the best shimmer out there and color blending, but the T5s often soften to it to what I would consider be the best overall look of almost any lighting option out there. I will say the diffused radions are very close and almost indistinguishable, but if I had a preference, it would be this, simply because it's working for me. So some of you refuse to use T5s and are diehard LED fans. I do think that you could have the same amount of success here, but I think it would be achieved with another row of castles for a 10 total on a six foot tank. You could probably get away with eight if you raise them up a bit and better distribution. 
Don't get me wrong, we would love to sell you another $1,500 in lighting, but in all honesty, I think a few hundred in T5s produces better results, both in coral health and visual appeal in the tank itself. For those of you that don't own a hood, Aquatic Life produces a hybrid T5 fixture that lets you use your own LED modules, including AI, radions, castles, and others, which is a legit option. But again, if we relied only on a single row of LED modules, regardless of the one we selected, with the exception of maybe the XR30s turned front to back, I don't think it would be anywhere near as successful. So the nuts and bolts of this is we spaced the Kessels one foot apart from each other on center, and from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. they slowly ramp from zero color and intensity to 40% color and 50% intensity. It stays there for six hours or at 5 p.m. and then slowly ramps down for an additional three hours to zero at 8 p.m. for a total of a 12-hour cycle. The T5s are on from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. as well, so six hours. I'm not saying this is the best program out there or anything. It's only what we've been using here for a long time with decent results and a solid starting point for anyone looking for somewhere to begin this journey or having current issues. Last thing related to the tank and stand itself, Chris Benner at Sticks and Stones Cabinetry did a knockout job on this stand. It's held up fantastically over the years. I mention it at this point because I can tell you that salt water is really hard on wood and finishes, and this stand and hood looks as good today as it did when we got it, and we're hard on it. The only exception is the brass knobs which have tarnished, which is to be expected. This is important because custom stands are not cheap and they all look nice day one, but many cabinets look pretty weathered over time, either warped, finishes destroyed, dull or peeling. I don't really throw around this kind of recommendation very often, but if I was going to get a stand, hood or in-wall project done where I need a proper stand frame and cabinets, the only one I'd consider is Chris. It's not cheap, but high quality furniture never is and likely it's going to be in your main living space, so it may be totally worth it. Okay, on to Triton, but actually before that I get asked all the time, what did you like better, KZ and Zeovit or Triton better? Many presuming Triton because we moved away from KZ, but I think it's valuable to add some clarity here. First, we didn't switch from Zeovit because it wasn't producing results. We switched because it was producing results for multiple years, and we got to share that journey with the community. It was just time to share something different with reefers, and in that spirit, I wouldn't be surprised if we tried something new on this tank in a year or so. Not something that I'd recommend at home, because you should stick to what works. Tanks thrive on stability, but the value of a video series like this one is seeing the results firsthand. I'd note that KZ is more about nutrient control, input and output, which allows you to use basically any calcium and alkalinity solution you want, two parts and calcium reactors being the most common, minor and trace elements handled with 10% water changes, and specific elements for specific colors or purposes. For those of you that may not have already known, we were using the BRS 2 part coupled with Zeovit when we ran it on this tank. But something a lot of people don't know, Triton actually makes a Core 7 4-part called Other Methods that you could absolutely use coupled with Zeovit's nutrient program if you wanted, rather than the Triton Method's refugium-based approach. Okay, so how is the Triton Method going? I'll start with the good. There's no question this system is absolutely producing results in terms of coral growth and coloration. The tank is progressing and really coming into itself. I do think it's fair to assume that some of this is related to maintaining proper near natural seawater chemistry levels with major, minor, and trace elements. Well, shooting for the ideal parameters at all times associated with Triton are not required for a successful reef tank. I think it'd be a mistake to not assume there are some benefits, and I do think that we're seeing some of them here. In that spirit, in combination with the ICP testing, there's no way that I've ever had a closer insight into what's going on in the reef tank chemistry, which removes a lot of the mystery behind the successes and challenges. I also think it's delivering on nutrient reduction as well as a reduction in manual labor like water changes, not complete elimination of water changes, but for sure a significant reduction. Related to that, for this 160 and the amount of biomass, we're still only dosing 57 milliliters of each element, so even maintenance of changing out the solutions is pretty low. So in many ways, this has been one of the easier ways to achieve success. Okay, so Triton hasn't been challenge free. I'm just gonna start with the obvious. Triton has had some serious packaging and stocking issues in the last year, issues which are certainly interlinked. This has been one of the most frustrating and alienating issues for any brand with reefers, retailers, and distributors that I can remember. I don't think anyone really cares as to the why, they just want results, but sometimes it is helpful to understand the background to get a reasonable expectation. 
end of the day, global demand just exceeded their production lines. At that time, they also didn't want to be directly responsible for tens of thousands of seemingly unnecessary plastic bottles entering the world. So they did what everyone does, call the packaging experts of the world and identify the best solution. I don't know how to say this any other way than I just don't know a single business owner who hasn't been burned by listening to the wrong expert at one point or another. End of the day, the cartons are greener, but they just don't protect the liquid product as well, particularly the caustic alkalinity portion. This whole transition just hasn't gone well and caused both leaky containers and stock outages. The solution here to get stock back into Triton users' hands as fast as possible is to ship the alkalinity portion dry where you add RODI water to the powder. Guess most people would prefer it in a liquid form, but this gives them the room to breathe and make stock issues a thing of the past. Most reefers will probably be okay with that. This really hasn't been pleasant for reefers, retails, and certainly not Triton, so I certainly support anything that solves the stocking and packaging issues as fast as possible. So outside of that, I don't know if I'd call them challenges, but there are some other notables with the Triton method. First, I'd say if the ICP report says you should do a single 10% water change, I don't know how critical it is, but if it says perform three, we've learned that it's wise to do so. It's not like the tank will crash, but if you don't, certain bellwether corals will start to show stress or even tissue loss if we don't. So that brings up an interesting observation. I think a lot of us have those bellwether corals which tell us something isn't right with the tank and that we should do something about it, often water changes or carbon. However, if we're waiting for an organism to show us signs of overwhelming distress like its flesh or tissue is receding, pulling or falling off its skeletal structure, I think we could say that we're waiting too long. So with ICP, we can actually have an opportunity to get in front of that, and better yet, with clear instructions on what to do. Not in every case, and some of it may have been coincidental because water changes are never a bad idea, but anything that allows us to get in front of issues and prevent them rather than treat them is what I would call substantial progress for the hobby. In addition to that, the last couple months here at BRS have been insane busy, so we missed a couple water changes the Triton test told us to do, and we had a loss here up front. I'm confident if we had listened, we could have avoided it rather than deal with it after the fact, because once things start to slip for a coral, they can go really fast. So the tests and getting in front of issues might seem like all upside, but I have to say it is a little bit debatable for the average reefer if sending in tests is easier than just performing the 10% water changes to begin with. I do think in the end it is easier to scoop out some water and mail it in and economically close to a wash or cheaper on larger tanks. This is the piece I'd probably put the most thought into. 10% weekly water changes will avoid a vast majority of chemistry issues and an okay solution to maintaining minor and trace elements. The Triton method, if followed, will do some things better and likely result in some additional benefits, but will also require a bit more discipline to not get complacent by not sending in those tests or acting on the vice. Once you stop working on the tank, it does take more discipline to keep it going and stay in tune with the tank. So in the end, with consistent water changes versus what the Triton method is trying to do and what's best here, I think it's up to the individual and really just one requiring more physical effort and time, the other requiring more mental effort and attention to detail, both are going to produce solid results. I do have a few other Triton notes before we move on. We do do water changes here from time to time and we have missed them because this is a work environment with constantly changing demands and life just doesn't allow for water changes all the time. I also got a baby due in two weeks so this is only going to get harder. So we installed an auto water change system on the 160. Neptune just added a task for the dose for basically push button water changes. Most people will use the auto water change function that goes over the entire month and very slow. But for Triton users that only perform them as needed, we needed a single use and Neptune came through. So go through that task and now anytime I need to change out 10% of the tank water, it's as simple as hitting feed mode D. It'll then perform my water change over the next 24 hours and even has a sensor option and it's fail safes. To me, this was a perfect hybrid of options, reduce the need for those water changes and then a two second option for doing them when they do need to be done doesn't get much better than that. Another notable here is there are some elements that do need to be dosed outside the core seven and many reefers ask what they are. It's potassium, strontium, boron, bromine, and iodine. Everything else stays pretty spot on. Iodine has been the biggest challenge, but I think that's the case in most tanks. 
Lastly, we answered a fat question a long time ago that said, can a fuge work too well? Back then I said no, I may like to revise that a bit because no matter what we do, we can't get any nitrate level readings in this tank. The fuge is actually only on three times a week and we dump six cubes of food, a bunch of amino acids, algae pellets, and a ton of reef chili in every day in a very limited water change environment. Still no detectable nitrate levels. We even started dosing a half a part per million nitrate with Brightwell's Neo Nitrate, no luck. Upped it up to one part per million a day and still no luck. I gotta tell you that I kind of feel like nutrient input is kind of a missing leg of the Triton method. Because of the huge and huge corals that you're likely to produce, they just suck up the nitrate or nitrogen. Someone asked me if we would consider removing the huge, and I have to say, no way. It's been a huge component of our success and how we actually got to this point. Now it would be a huge destabilizing event and major risk if we removed it. So I'm going to take a page from some of the coral pros out there. We recently visited the Worldwide Corals Facility for a new series that we're working on. And they feed their heavy stock tanks on the hour, every hour, at least during business hours, with the house-made food. So we made some of our own using shrimp, scallops, cod, fish eggs, nori, reef chili, and some other things. And we're going to start feeding this a bit more frequently and see what we can make happen. I will say I think I saw a positive response to dosing the nitrate daily and I'm not against that, but I like to think about nutrients as much more than nitrate and phosphate. To some degree, it's more helpful to think of nutrients more holistically as protein and energy. It might be actual chunks of protein-rich foods or particulates, fats, carbohydrates, or dissolved amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, as well as nitrogen and phosphorus, which are the building blocks of amino acids, the photosynthetic process, energy formation, and DNA. So in a future update, we will certainly share how the new feeding regimen, as well as nitrate dosing, works out. I would, however, implore people with newer tanks to not go out and try this stuff because you'll likely end up with a serious algae issue. Just feeding your fish is most likely enough for standard new tanks. So what else is in the future for the 160? Well, I gotta tell you, the smartest thing that we could do is probably leave it alone. But in the hunt for ever better results in coloration, I would like to increase flow, but to do that, we would need to remove the sand. Removing the sand would be a major destabilizing event, so it would be best done over like a year with a few cups a week and something that we may start doing. I may also consider raising the lights up and then compensating by turning the castles up to get better coverage and reduce some of the shading. And or maybe increasing the length of the photo period a bit by reducing the ramp time it takes to get to peak par and extending the T5 period out. But I think I'd only add like 15 minutes a month. We got success here and there's no hurry. But that's about it. Other than that, we might get some new corals as well as some new fish. It is a hobby after all and we need to keep it fun. In that spirit, we're going to try to keep it fun by giving away a Radeon XR30 Pro this week. This is one of those rare times where they're on sale, so click that link in the lower left or head on over to the site and click on specials and deals and then free stuff to sign up. I don't have all the next weeks planned out quite yet and I do have a baby coming any moment so everything's a bit up in the air but in the coming weeks I would expect to see a ULM update, a clown harem tank update, an update on the elevated water parameter testing and hopefully a brand new series with worldwide corals where we really dive into not just the success that you've achieved but also the details on how to replicate it yourselves. So hit that subscribe button and notification bell to be notified when all of these come out. And now that we've all seen Triton on this tank, take a moment to answer this week's Reef to Reef poll or see what others have to say. Would you consider running Triton Method on your tank? See you next week with another episode of BRS TV.